So let's go on to other problems. You've also thought about coronary artery disease and why, I, when I talk with patients about evolutionary medicine, they often say, couldn't we just have had slightly bigger coronary arteries, please? <laughs> it would solve so many problems. Um, what, do you, what do you make about that? Well, I, I I did go into that quite a lot as to why we ended up with coronary arteries at all, uh -huh. because it does seem to at be at all. Well, yes, the heart I mean, has to get blood. The heart has to get blood. I mean, this is the th this is the interesting thing about the heart. It is the the, the uh, a big muscular organ in the centre of our body, it's extraordinarily electrically coordinated, capable of supplying our high pressure blood systems with the blood it needs. And it never it's takes a, a break for a few. It never days. takes a break. It's a hugely yeah. efficient pump, but when where does it get its food and oxygen from? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look back through the vertebrate animal kingdom, um, evolution has found lots of different ways of making sure that the heart at least gets enough blood supply to function reasonably well. Um, all the same in all organisms, or are there variations? Well, it, it largely, to cut a long story short, it largely depends on how compact the heart muscle, the myocardium, is. So if you look at frogs and other amphibia, you'll find that the, the heart muscle wall is extremely spongy. It's um, uh, rather like a mesh of cells instead of a, a hmm. tight bunch of... Um, it doesn't have to plump packed. that much blood that far. It, it's, it's partly to do with that. Um, but um, what happens is that it receives blood from its own ventricles. See, that makes so much sense. Which if is, the heart has plenty of blood, why bother with coronary arteries? Why bother with coronary arteries? Because in fact, well, in, in, in uh, reptiles and amphibia, what basically happens is the blood um, under pressure, under sort of um, uh, ventricular pressure, is forced into the spongy mass of heart uh, muscle cells, mm. bathing them, feeding them quite happily. Sounds very simple and direct and safe. And passing on around the rest No of heart the attacks. But the, the more we've um, evolved to become really active um, vertebrates, really active mammals, the more we've needed a higher pressure uh, blood system and the more we've needed more dense myocardium. And we, we've got to the point where it is impossible to get blood into this myocardium unless we pipe it in from outside. So it's just too tight. It's just, yeah, too, there's, too no, dense. there's no way you can get anything in there at all mm -hmm. um, uh, in the sense that there's no way blood from the ventricles itself can possibly get into the muscle mass. So it has to come out from so, somewhere So what else. about the coronary arteries getting plugged up? I mean, I suppose one could say it often takes, you know, 50 or 70 years for them to get plugged up, which is better than the drains in our kitchens. Um, but <laughs> even so... Uh, they do get plugged up, and it's very unfortunate. Well, well, they do, and there's been a very interesting debate as to whether it's all our own fault. Um, you know, whether it's uh, to do with lack of exercise, smoking, the wrong diet, and stuff like that, that basically we are to blame. We've clogged these arteries up, and that if you go back far enough, although they're small, narrow bore, you know, vessels, they would have worked perfectly well. Right. Um, but uh, uh, several groups have now taken advantage of the very big uh, mummy collections in Egypt and elsewhere, and Alaskan mummies and um, uh, Mexican mummies, and all these sorts of things. So you're going back to um, uh, humans who lived many thousands of years ago. And um, they've uh, managed to retrieve sufficient material of their um, arteries uh, to determine that um, galloping atherosclerosis was a fact of life going way mm. back then. And in populations where you couldn't point the finger at either smoking or diet or lack of exercise. No, it's such a fascinating thing that we don't actually have confidence in the epidemiology of cardiovascular disease. In the UK back 100 years ago, it was said to be very uncommon, um, and in the United States too, And but there's been this epidemic. What is causing it? Is it just because we're lethargic and eating our hamburgers and ice cream? We have one colleague here who's joining our, our center, Ben Trumbull, who's hauled scanners into the jungle in Bolivia, and his preliminary results suggest that there's hardly any coronary artery disease compared to what you see um, in more developed societies. But that doesn't mean to say it's because they're eating wholesome things like roots and No, tubes. who knows how many things. Um, uh, but what I think it does mean is that they probably have much better regulated immune systems, here we go again, uh -huh. than we do. And I think um, uh, 
the the I mean, there have been a number of big studies, big meta studies now, um, that that have shown that um, uh, low density lipoproteins, you know, the bad cholesterol, uh, is a very very poor indicator of the probability that you will go on to heart disease and stroke. Hmm. And uh, Paul Ridker at Harvard, particularly, and Goran Hansen in the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, are the two leading exponents of the alternative theory that actually it's immune system activity and inflammation in mm -hmm. the intima, in the arterial wall, mm -hmm. that actually promotes the galloping rate of um, thrombus formation, uh, mm -hmm. of atherosclerotic uh, plaque formation in the mm -hmm. arterial wall. Actually, I worked on a paper with Alan Weeder, who was the head of hypertension research at University of Michigan years ago, on why on earth there were inflammatory cells in the lining of the blood vessels, and our conclusion was very simple, of course. You'd damn well better uh, be able to prevent pathogens from moving back and forth in and out of your arterioles. Uh, that's in a special place where you need defense. Right, but the, um, the, the problem comes when um, uh, lower density lipoproteins appear where they jolly well shouldn't. Mm. Uh, and if they go swimming along in the middle of art arteries and veins, that's absolutely fine. But if they stick to the, surf to the interior lining, the endothelial lining of um, blood vessels, they can migrate through into the sub-endothelial um, uh, space. And there they crop up where they're jolly well not expected. And of course the immune system goes into attack. And so you get um, uh, uh, immune cells uh, latching on to LDL and produce, you know, pouring out these messenger molecules we call cytokines and you start this inflammatory reaction. And um, Hansen has shown that if you, um, that uh, regulatory T cells in the arterial wall will actually um, calm that down. And that if you actually produce, uh, give a drug which in effect um, silences the receptor for LDL on immune cells so that they don't form complexes with the LDL, again, atherosclerotic plaque doesn't happen. That sounds like a fabulous drug. Is it in uh, development? It's in development. Um, at the Karolinska Institute, yes. How fascinating. Yeah. How and fascinating. of course, we've got the very exciting thought that uh, Paul Ridker at Harvard has this enormous trial underway at the moment because he did a preliminary amount of work. A trial on but the, the Yeah, yeah. But basically, um, the preliminary work was that he said, well, look, if LDL is a very, very poor indicator of risk of near future development of heart disease, uh, what's a better indicator? And um, research determined that two pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1 and interleukin-6, were far better predictors. Is that right? But the chemical assay for those, if you're thinking about assaying a population of people, is rather expensive. Mm. And so he thought, well, what else can I use? And he looked at um, this thing called C-reactive protein, mm -hmm. CRP, which turns out to be a brilliant indicator, both in men and women who are asymptomatic at the time that the um, measurement is taking. So a lot of coronary artery disease is an inflammatory disease exactly. then. Exactly. Uh, heart disease uh, joins the long list now of diseases where inflammation and possibly or arguably poorly regulated immune systems are at the bottom of it. So it sounds like we should all be grateful if we don't have coronary artery disease and slightly amazed. Um, well, I think it depends, again, very much on um, what is happening in terms of our chronic inflammatory status. I mean, the reason your Bolivian example is a case in point, um, and Caleb Finch at the University of South California has um, done enormous amounts of work in these ethnic areas of the Amazon and places like that, is because if, you know, they're measuring CRP, which is terribly easy and cheap to do, and he notices that in a lot of these populations, of course they get infections all the time. It's a very dirty place. There's lots of nasty insects, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So they're always running a fever. They're always getting a new infection, and they're always running high levels of CRP. But as soon as they get rid of the infection, the CRP comes whacking back down to baseline. So if you look over a period of a year or two in these people, you get that kind of very sharp picture of peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs. Mm -hmm. But if you look in Western populations, boom, you just get this great high plateau of CRP all mm -hmm. the time. It's not adaptive. It's up there in a pathological level all the time.